The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 758 for Monday, April 22nd, 2019. Uh, Ratings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take all your questions, all your tips, all your cool stuff found. All of that stuff, and we mix it all together and, you know, loosely form it into an agenda. We try to tell a story, but mostly we try to make sure that every single one of us, you and me included, learns at least five new things every single time we get together doing what I like to call our communal head scratching, right? You know, we just we take these things, we ponder them. Sometimes we have the answers. Sometimes you have the answers and we share them on your behalf. You know, it's just we get together and we do this communal head scratch again to learn at least five new things. Sponsors for this episode include Otherworld Computing at MacSales.com. We'll talk about their new Aura Pro X2 NVMe flash SSDs and also Malwarebytes for Mac because Malwarebytes uh, for Mac can do some wonderful things for you as we've been talking about on the show for a long time. We'll talk more about it a little bit later here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. How you doing today, Mr. John F. Braun? Eh. Just eh? That's not good. Yeah. Huh. Oh. Nah, it's kind of dreary. Out. Ah, yes. Yeah. It's 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 the April showers time of the year here in New England. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we'll, we'll get past flood it. Alert. <laughs> What's that? Or flash flood uh, season. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we get them on the coast here yep. pretty regularly. Yep. Far enough away, fortunately. Yeah, you're like, I mean, you're far enough. It, that is true that you are far enough away on, or, or fortunately far enough away. But you're really only like a, a block or two away uh, from where the flood line generally hits, right? Oh, when the, when we had uh, Sandy, um, the water got to the street. Uh, the closest uh, side street to me. Um, pretty scary. Yeah, that's that's pretty scary. I I, I agree. <laughs> that's, that's a little too close for comfort. Then the tide. The, the, yeah, the tide was going out and then it came back in. Sure. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. The last minute. Yeah. Well, we'll say hello to Kenny on the uh, well in the chat room uh, on the Jersey Shore. Of course, the chat room is at macgeekup.com slash stream. The Jersey Shore is south of both John and I. Uh, because he says he's sitting on his deck in the sunshine listening. And if you want to join the, the chat room while we record, MacGeekab.com slash stream is where that is. Uh, and you can join us at MacGeekab.com slash calendar to find out when all that will happen. I think the calendar's still working. There's some weirdness going on with, with calendar lately, though. So we'll, we'll get there. Uh, but we have some follow-ups and some questions and some tips and all of that good stuff. And we're going to start with something from listener Chris, uh, who asks, I think I have this right. Uh, maybe I thought I did. You know, I put the wrong Chris in here, didn't I, John? Uh, you know, this is what happens some, some, sometimes on a, uh, on a Sunday morning and we'll, we'll get there. Chris asks, he says, uh, in episode 757, you were talking about your favorite apps. Uh, the, the apps, the must have apps that you would install on a new Mac. He said, how can you not have a password manager as your number one pick for a new Mac? Neither one of you listed a password manager. And he says, and I know you both use them without that. I'd not be able to sign into any of the other great apps that you mentioned. And you're right. Uh, a password manager is vital in today's world. Um, and I, for me, certainly it was, it was an oversight, right? These are, these are the things that we, uh, we take for granted, right? And it's it, that's how it works. That's why we put the call out to all of you. That said, iCloud Keychain is a pretty good password manager. It's not great, but uh, it's it's gotten way better. And it it is for I would say for many people, if maybe not most listeners here, but many listeners here, it is enough. Certainly, I recommend you use it. 100% of you use it, even if you're also using 
another password manager, like one password or last pass or something like that. Uh, I run, I run one password that's been running that for a very long time since before iCloud keychain existed. But I also run iCloud keychain because, well, up until iOS 12, the integration of password managers and Safari on iOS was not optimal. And so it just kept two databases and they really did keep each other in sync. It wasn't, it's not a big deal to manage. Uh, and even with iOS 12, there are times where I find it handy to have access to both of, of, of them, you know, at, at my fingertips, so to speak. So, so yeah, there you go. Thoughts on that, John? Uh, last pass for me. Do you use uh, iCloud Keychain? No. Interesting. Interesting. Ha- and like, I guess now with iOS 12, you can mostly survive, right? Um, mm-hmm. it, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, it integrates nicely. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. But yeah, no, good suggestion. Yeah. I, I didn't even. It, it probably is one of the first things that I install. It, he's right. Yeah, machine, for sure. Because I need passwords. We need our passwords. Sometimes I don't even know what they are, you know? Right. Right. It, you know, LastPass uh, generates a, you know, one per your specifications. Yeah. And that, that's, I think that's why I like having iCloud Keychain running sort of in parallel as a, as a backup, if you will, because if I am on a Mac and one password isn't running or, you know, isn't installed or something like I know my passwords will be compatible with any Apple device that I'm going to use. Like no question doesn't matter. I know they're there. Uh, even though for the most part, I use one password to invoke them most of the time. So yeah, good question, Chris, and and good addition to the, uh, to the list and make sure to send yours in feedback at MacGeekab.com. Did you say feedback at MacGeekab.com? I did say feedback at MacGeekab.com. One other thing I would like to ask a favor. Uh, I know we ask this from time to time, but if you would go to MacGeekab.com slash iTunes, and then you've got to click a couple of times because it's how Apple does it. But that's as close as we can get you. MacGeekUp.com slash iTunes. And then just go leave us a review. And if you've left us a review in the past, good news, you can update it. And that actually helps us when, when your review is updated or when a new review is posted. It really does help. And, uh, and we would appreciate it. It, it, uh, it makes things good. It makes things uh, pop up on iTunes. That brings in more listeners. That brings in more questions and more answers and all of that good stuff. So, uh, so please leave us reviews. Yeah, it would be good. All right. Douglas has a question, and that one I do have ready to go here. Douglas says, um, I, he, has, he has several questions. We'll see. We'll see what we get. He says, we'll start with number one. He says, a friend is migrating from Windows to Mac uh, and moving his data over. The only snag we've hit is mail. He was using Windows Live Mail. Unfortunately, he was using a pop account. So the email files exist only on his local volume in .eml format. So we need to find a way to get them into Mac OS mail. The only solution I can find requires purchasing commercial conversion software. Is there an easier way to import EML files into the Mac? We'll start there. And then we, we he's got a couple others. We'll probably get to the second one too. Um, EML files should be readable by mail. Uh, as I understand it, they are individual email files, similar to the way mail stores mail and eml x files so i think mail will read them uh, i found a, a post on stack exchange i didn't have any eml files here to test with but i found a post on stack exchange that talks about putting these eml files just into folders and then telling mail to slurp those folders in and i think that will do it 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 stands to reason that it would although like i said i i'm unable to test it john do you have any experience with any of this or thoughts about it or research or anything like that no i mean i'm looking so in mail you get two choices here uh if you say import import from apple mail sure or files in mbox format <clears throat> hmm. i i uh so you, you go to import mailboxes right and then mm-hmm. yeah files in mbox format and then just point the uh point the thing at, at your folder and and slurp it in i i think that's what i think that's that will work yeah because so i think it's going to look at those folders and and slurp through it yeah, that, that, yeah. 
Because inbox format, I mean, inbox is a format, but I, I've done that to import folders of EMLX files before, and that has definitely worked. So I, I think that label in Mac OS Mail's import engine might be a bit of a misnomer. Yeah, I think you're right, because I'm digging here. So mbox, I think within the mbox files, let me just drill down here. Uh, never mind. But yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a EL, the whatever file yeah. when you get down to it, and an mbox is a container for that. So. Correct. Yeah, well... It, it, it's it's both right inbox can be the folder with the emlx files um which is what apple uses now and apple but apple moved to that because of spotlight so that they would have individual files to index for each message and then you could pull up uh things in spotlight right that that was the catalyst to that prior to that though apple used what i would call sort of classic inbox format which is where each mailbox like inbox would be one sent would be you know another etc cetera, etc cetera. each mailbox was its own mbox file which is like a unix thing it's not a package or anything like that it's just one big long file of every message that's in there as i remember it it's been it's been a while but i think eudora did the same thing i think it's stored in what i'll call classic mbox format so but i, I think mail will import all of these things that we've discussed uh, all right. Second one from Douglas here is he says, uh, Dave, you are a one password user. He says, I use one password with a purchased license, not a subscription. He says, I've been syncing my one password files via Dropbox. I would now like to switch and sync through iCloud. First of all, do you recommend that or would you recommend staying with Dropbox? And number two, if I switch to iCloud, what is the best way to do so? Making sure all my vaults are transferred. Yeah, so I'm at, I'm in the same boat as you. You're right. I used one password as I said before, and I do currently sync that with Dropbox, but I keep considering moving that to iCloud syncing for two reasons. Number one, I've got a bunch of storage in iCloud that I'm paying for anyway, and I might as well use it. But number two, and and this is just a theory. I have not confirmed this, but I, I actually now that we're doing this segment, I'll send this to the folks at One Password and, and get an answer here because my question to you at One Password is, I think. I know that with Dropbox, the only time my vault syncs is if I launch the 1Password app. So if all I'm doing is navigating around in Safari on, on iOS, on Mac, it's syncing all the time. But on iOS, it seems to me like it only syncs if I launch the 1Password app, which means if I've changed some passwords or updated things or added things and I don't launch the 1Password app, I don't get those. And those changes aren't there until I launch the app and let it run for a few seconds where it can like, you know, go connect to Dropbox and sync. iCloud syncing, of course, happens at the OS level in the background. So I'm wondering if 1Password can process those sync changes also in the background or if I'm still going to have to launch the app to do it. But either way, I've been thinking about switching and I've looked into this and it's pretty straightforward. Um, you just uh, move it on on one machine and then attach the others there you uh you just go into uh i mean on your on your mac you would you would launch one password you would go to preferences in the one password menu and then you'd go to sync and you'll have all your vaults listed there and it'll say sync this vault whatever the name of it is uh, with dropbox and you can change it to a folder so you could sync it with something else although test that to make sure the something else syncs things in a way that one password is okay with it. Uh, but sync it with Dropbox or sync with iCloud. Once you move that, then just go to your other devices and, and move that. And, and in theory, I think that's, that's all you need to do. Uh, I have, I have done this with other people and it, it has worked fine. So does your last pass sync John with iCloud or is it, are you using something else? Uh, I think I'm syncing with them. <clears throat> oh, right. That's right. Yes, 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 yes. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, they've always been the cloud thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, any more on that? Or are we good? We're good. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, for people that are migrating or have LastPass, and uh, 
want to migrate to another platform there there really is no you just launch it and log into your account and you're good to go and that's also the way one password currently works if you have a one password subscription it's the same sort of thing you're syncing with their cloud and it just happens and, and all of that so we'll get some answers from them on on how this works because that that would be good to know you know where the where the benefits are so especially on ios having that data always at your fingertips always up to date is is the key and i want to find out if we can have that do you know if that happens with LastPass on ios or do you have to launch the app in order to get changes to to follow through uh i do not know okay okay fair well we'll we'll look into this this is a this is a good little little thread to tug on a little bit here um uh, mike has a question he says um I'm following up on the Wi-Fi problem, some Wi-Fi problems that I've been having. He says, I've been trying different combinations of devices to see if I can nail down what's causing my connections to drop. He says, uh, so far, the most stable setup I have is to have uh, my access point radios completely off. Uh, so he has a Verizon, a Verizon router as his router. And then he has been using... I think we talked about him in a previous episode using um, uh, uh, TP-Link 802.11n only extender uh, as an uh, at router, but in bridge mode as an access point. And uh, he says, uh, with turning those off, that solves the problem. He says, my Wemo switches are able to connect. Everything stays online. I'm not having problems with my TiVo or Netflix refusing to play. He says, of course, the main issue is coverage. Now that I've turned off my effective extender, he says, I don't have coverage in the rooms where I want to have it. Uh, he says, I have marginal signal. And he says, I figured my Verizon router can cover most of the house with 2G Wi-Fi, he says. So I turned the 5G off at the Verizon router and turned 5G back on on the TP-Link access point. So this is now turning off the 802.11ac Wi-Fi on the main router and turning the 802.11n 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi on on the extender. Uh, he says, I set the power to low because I can since I since it's very close to all the seating in there. And that's what he wants to get to. He says everything still seems good. No network devices are dropping or anything. And this is a this is an interesting thing, right? Because he's using some of the principles that we've talked about here, especially where you can setting the power level to only uh, to not spill past where you want it to spill past, and that way devices aren't going to be hopping uh, unnecessarily back and forth between your your access points some mesh systems will do this automatically for you most will not most do just you know consumer grade mesh anyway just broadcast at 100 percent and that's that uh, and so you can oversaturate your house with some of this stuff uh, so you just need to be aware and he says uh, i followed your suggestions on the show using wi-fi explorer uh, he says i have a a version of NetSpot at netspotapp.com. He says, I found a blueprint of our house and I loaded it into NetSpot. Then I went from room to room, surveying the Wi-Fi with many combinations of 2G and 5G being off and on, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, several of the surveys showed no 5G at all uh, wherever I was. He says, so I'm skeptical whether the access points are even working correctly. He says, but as you suggested, simpler seems to be better. He says, so for now I'm running with the one router on two gigahertz only and the access point with five gigahertz only on low power. And that seems to be working. He had an issue with his Wemo plugs and uh, it's, and, and they would work, but then they would fall off. And I think those Wemo plugs, like most smart home devices, even a lot of cameras are two gigahertz only. So I, I think that explains maybe why his Wemo devices were jumping back and forth and maybe getting confused if there was too much signal for them. Uh, so he might be able to turn five gigahertz back on on his Verizon box. But the problem with that is now you're running two different flavors of five gigahertz. You've got N and AC. So better to have extenders, it, it, all of your access points, at least supporting the same protocols. Uh, so that when devices jump from one to the other, there's not potential confusion. Although maybe, maybe I'm making something out of nothing here. 
Any thoughts on this, Mr. Braun? No, good. Um, good analysis doing a site survey. Yeah, that really is like that's that's the thing you want to do is is use you know something like you know I mean he's using NetSpot, which is really what's built for this, uh, to to go around and and see and log where he's seeing which signals, how strong they are, and then kind of deciding where to place things and being very intentional and strategic about it. Um, I, I, I like this. This is good. We all, we all should be so diligent, Mike, because I'm sure I know at times I've had my house set up where I'm just like over bathing in Wi-Fi and, and actually causing problems. Like I earlier, uh, late last year, I guess, maybe not earlier this year, but I don't know. The last few months, I was having some recurring problems and it was like, all right, I need to thin things out here. And I did. And it was like, oh, look, everything got better. Like, yeah, I, I knew better. I just, you know, do as I say, not as not as we do. That's the we have to experiment here and learn. And sometimes that means breaking stuff. But, you know, then we get to share one other option that could be used in a scenario like Mike is talking about here is to use a separate SSID. It could be from a completely separate router. It could be if your router supports it, the same router, just, you know, sharing an, a different SSID and have that only be a two gigahertz SSID and only coming from one place. And then that way you attach all of your smart home devices to that. They won't be jumping around and having this problem that potentially was happening with his Wemo devices. And, and that can simplify things without, negatively impacting your ability to you know connect to say five gigahertz when you're near the verizon router or whatever like just you know offloading those things it 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 can if you want to simplify that can definitely work and some some mesh routers will let you change your 2.4 gigahertz you know ssid i know the the linksys velop ones will i think the orbi does they keep changing things in their firmware but i'm pretty sure you can sort of manually manage that and that can that can be a handy thing too so yeah good anything more on this john yeah okay um you know before we we've got we're sort of dipping into this smart home realm before we do that i want to take a minute if i can take a minute john and talk about our first sponsor yeah sure all right sweet uh, I want to talk about other world computing here. OWC's got their new Aura Pro X2 NVMe flash SSDs. These things, like, this is what you can get for your older Mac to add blazing fast SSDs, like up to twice as fast as the original, up to 3,200 megabytes per second read, 2,400 megabytes per second write. They go up to two terabytes, right? 16 times greater capacity, right? You know, and they consume less power and run cooler than older models. And here's the thing. You get to keep your same Mac with this faster SSD, with this bigger SSD, your keyboard, all of your ports, right? I know how it is. John likes his ports. Well, guess what? You can now upgrade your SSD, get some real boost out of that thing while keeping all of your stuff, your keyboard, your Mac, your ports, just more space and speed. And you got to check it out. Go to MacSales.com. You know, the, the beauty of, of Mac sales is they, 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 they are like us, right? That's why this product is able to exist because they have all the same uh, experiences that we do. They are Mac users. They understand this. They've been Mac users longer then many of us have been Mac users. They've been longer Mac users longer than a lot of us have been alive, right? They know, they know this stuff. They live in this world and that's why they're able to do this, but they also understand how it works and all of that stuff. It's why it's the first place I go. If I need to buy, you know, something to expand or enhance my Mac, because I know if I, if OWC offers it and I get it from them, I know that it's going to work. They, you know, they, they make this stuff this way. So you got to check it out. Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. And of course, our thanks to Otherworld Computing for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Now, let's see. Um, smart home time, shall we? Let's no. go to, let's go to, no. Yeah, it's good. Smart home's fun. Jeff has a question. And I, it, this is great because it's going to open some doors for us. 
He says, um, with HomeKit, I'm pretty entrenched into the Apple ecosystem and my condo is littered with Apple HomeKit compatible devices. He says, I have automation set up on my phone that basically says when I turn on the bedroom Lutron light switch, uh, it turns on my bedroom hue bulbs, right? And <clears throat> if it's a specific time of day, they turn on it a specific color. The question is, if my iPhone is not at home and I'm at work and the light switch is used, how is this automation still working? Where are the automation rules being stored? He says, sure, I have an Apple TV 4K, but Apple claims this is needed only for controlling devices from outside your home network. Is it also storing the automation rules when my iPhone is not at home and the light switch is used? So, yes, this is the answer. And this is <clears throat> this is a good thing to think about when when you're looking at home automation, right? It's possible to do all your home automation with Bluetooth, right? And if as long as your phone or some other device is there, everything can work. But as soon as you take that device out, like your phone, it doesn't happen. But you can still have the devices, right? So a hub is a device that does two different things or can do two different things. Often they're in the same device. One function of a hub is to connect to devices that aren't Wi-Fi compatible, right? If you've got, like you said, your Hue bulbs, I can't remember if your Lutron switches are Wi-Fi compatible, like the LifeX bulbs are, the Philips Hue bulbs aren't, they use Zigbee or something else, right? And you need a hub for them to connect to. Once you have that hub, that connects it to your network, right? To either Wi-Fi or Ethernet. So that's the hub doing one job, you know, routing between what you have and what they are. The other job of a hub is to be that always on server, if you will, managing your automation and also sending out notifications if things happen when you're not home and all of that. But that's part of automation, right? And yes, your Apple TV is being your hub. And you can figure out if you have a HomeKit hub in your house, your HomeKit devices will work without one. But like you said, only if your iPhone is there. But you can look, launch the home app on your phone. I think actually you could do it on your Mac if you're running Mojave. I'm pretty sure this is all there. But uh, on your phone, go to the home, which on your phone is at the bottom left icon. Then in the upper left is a picture of your of a house, not your house. But tap that little icon and then it'll show you some details about your house, what people are attached to it, uh, some other stuff. And one of the things near the top is going to be a section called home hubs. If you have one or more devices that can be a home hub, they will be listed there and it will show you which one is the quote unquote master and a home cub home hub can be, as you noted, an Apple TV or a home pod. Yep. Or an iPad can actually be set up this way. Oddly, not yet a Mac. So, you know, there you go. But an iPad can be set uh, as a home hub. You need it. Uh, plugged in or at least powered all the time. So if you figure that part out, but then, yeah, you can have an iPad always on that's, that's doing the, the home hub functionality, but Apple TV will automatically do it. HomePod will automatically do it. And they, they vote amongst one another to decide who is, if you have more than one to decide who is the master. Um, I've had a scenario where that got screwed up and I had to like unplug things for an hour to let it all settle out so they could revote properly. But anyway, yeah, that's it. We'll put a link in the show notes to an article about that, but, uh, but yeah, you're, you're so, so yes, now that with that foundation, your Apple TV is your home kit hub and it is taking care of all the automation. Generally speaking, it's taking care of the automation, even when you're home because it can, and there's no reason to burden your iPhone with this, but certainly when you're not home, uh, you, you know, your, your Apple TV is there doing its thing and it can alert you to different things. And, and you can also then send controls to it as long as it has proper access to the internet and all of that. Uh, you can send controls to it and it will, you know, turn your lights on and off or whatever you want to do. Yeah. See cameras if they are HomeKit compatible cameras. I started messing with HomeKit again this week, John. With all our talk about it, I installed HomeBridge again on my Synology so that uh, all of my non HomeKit compatible devices could be populated. And you know what? It's really not that big of a pain in the neck. The, the worst part is that when you install HomeBridge, uh, you have to load the plugins for all of the devices that you might have. And if you miss one, 
it won't, it just won't see that device. And so it's not like a smart thing where like, if the device was home kit compatible, it just magically sort of shows up or you just scan it and you go like, like I forgot to add my TP link switches. And it's like, Oh, I got to go get the home kit, the home bridge TP link plugin. And I got to tell it to load that, you know, when home bridge launches. So it's a little bit wonky for sure, but you know what, once you get it up and running, uh, it's pretty stable and, and it is kind of cool having all those devices in, in home kit. That's, but that's not my main hub, at least not currently. I'm still I'm still using Stringify as my main automation hub, which is a cloud based unit. But uh, as we discussed, that's going away. So, but you've been messing with hubs, John. Or any thoughts about this before we get into your your hub no, messing? Okay. No, no. Nope. Kay. Um. Yeah, you may want to consider a different one because I just switched over. So it was Friday. And I go into my uh, TV room and I ask you know who to turn on the lights and uh, and her reply was uh, yeah your your uh, Wink Hub is uh, is offline or, or not plugged in so I can't do that. That's so nice. And I'm like yeah you know it's like a monthly you know monthly outages now and uh, you know I don't want to deal with that so you know as as I told you I bought a smart thing so I'm like. Um, which is a Samsung product. Right, right. Um, I bought one of those. And I'm like, you know what? Let me, uh, I'm going to bring everybody over. And I only have, well, well, I have now one, two, three, four, like six bulbs. Okay. And, uh, and those are Zigbee. And then I got three thermostats that are Z Wave and it supports both those protocols. Okay. So um, the hardest part was, you know, unpairing and, repairing everything it wasn't that hard either um on the bulbs typically you do some sort of on off pattern and it'll then you know blink or pulse when sure. it's in pairing mode and then you tell the app um and then i told the smart things that the, the only thing that was kind of weird though so like uh, the the bulbs i have are cree bulbs or mm-hmm. so most of them are cree bulbs and it has an explicit entry it's like hey you want to add a device and i'm like yeah it's a cree device and they're like okay go for it and it's sitting there and sitting there and sitting there and it never paired. And I'm like, well, that's stupid. Here's how you solve that problem. <clears throat> the thing is, when you see a list of supported devices um, in either of the apps, whether it be the Wink app or the Smart Things app, um, a lot of times you can choose something else. And this is actually how I solve the problem. So Got I'm like, it. you know what? Let, let me pick something more generic. And I, and I think I, I pick Smart Things. So they also make sensors. and, and Sure. Stuff. I'm like, you know what? Let me let me choose that. And it was like, oh yeah, I found your creep bulb, or oh yeah, I found your thermostat. So that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So that was the only hitch. But you know, there's a, a nothing really changed as far as the the commands that I issue to you know who, because there's a smart thing skill in addition to a wink skill. So nothing changed. Okay, so you just highlighted like, this is a great thing to sort of you know circle back on what we were saying with Jeff here, your smart things hub in its current setup is being used as the first kind of hub. We discussed the bridge to devices that can't otherwise connect to your network. And that's great, right? I mean, you need that. And obviously when you don't have that, things don't work. So moving from wink to smart things for that. Great. But you are not currently using smart things as your automation hub or an automation hub. You can certainly run multiples, although you know <laughs> that. Oh no! I, that can, it's, I thought you said you were using the Amazon A Lady as your automation hub. Oh. See what I'm saying? So there's two different uses. Well, well, the thing is, I also assigned some. So I, I had to define some uh, um, actions. Yeah. If you will, or okay. Scripts. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, that's yeah. within the Smart Things. Got it. App and the Smart Things service. So yeah, the other thing I had to do was set up a. Smart Things account, just like you have to set up a Wink account, or I guess, uh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. No, you don't set it. up a home, yeah. You don't set up a HomeKit account. That well, I mean, you do. It's connected to your iCloud account and and all of that, like you know, like Apple does. Um, but okay, so you're doing some automation through your Smart Things, uh, just through the you know configured by the Smart Things app, but handled by the Smart Things service, which is you know a cloud service that talks to your smart things hub right so they have 
so you can in the app here. So it's, you can say add device, yeah, add scene, which I haven't done that yet. Add automation, mm. and I actually added a bunch um, that I had on the other side, which is basically to uh, at certain times of day set each of the thermostats either up or down. Got it. Okay, so do you do it? it so let uh, I me. Mean, I just I want to make sure we shine this light properly for everybody out there. In in the uh, Amazon A Lady app that you uh, could launch, you you can set up your skills, which are linked to your devices. But you can also set routines, which is their version of automations. Just like in the HomeKit app, the bottom on the phone, the bottom right icon is automation, right? So you can have these things, and and you can have automations running in you know from multiple places. Uh, hopefully, you remember where they each are because if you need to tweak one or turn it on or off, then you have them in, you know, as I just described three different places that can be a little bit crazy. But um, what I'm curious about with now that you're on smart things is everybody has told me and told us that smart things really is certainly one of the best automation hubs out there because it's so flexible, right? This is what we loved about stringify, except now it's going away because stringify was fairly easy to use, but, but very flexible in terms of, you know, I could have multiple triggers and it could be a time of day. And, you know, if there's motion and if that lights on, right, you know, and so you can have all these things mm-hmm. trigger in and that's great. A, the Amazon, a ladies triggers will do some of that, but, but really generally only two things and home kit will do two things as long as one of them is time of day. Otherwise it's only, you get one sensor and, and one act and, and then a series of actions. But you can only have, you know, one sensor plus a time of day if if you want, whereas smart things, I think uh, certainly there's and there's there's several ways to go. Uh, there's the smart things app, but then there's something that's that Samsung or smart things calls WebCore, W-E-B-C-O-R-E. And that's a far more detailed way of interacting with the smart things automation stuff. And so what I'm curious about with you now is what other things from your smart home life, like you needed your smart things hub to talk to your bulbs. Okay. But that's not the end of the things your smart things hub can talk to. I'm curious. Can it take a trigger, say from your nest cam or drop can, can it take a trigger from your ring doorbell? Right. Cause that's a cool thing. I, for example, I have, uh, and this is yes, what I was doing. Knows, was, go ahead. It knows about ring. It, yeah. it doesn't see my drop cam because it's not a real, IP camera. But neither is your ring, right? Ring, it's seeing through the ring service. Yes, yes. And so could it, could you link it somehow so that it sees your drop cam through the drop cam service, right? Just like, just hack. like Amazon's A Lady does. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a hack at some point, okay. but they don't anymore. Um, because then you can do things like, like I'm doing, you know, where it's like my, my ring driveway motion sensor sees motion. Uh, if it's between midnight and 6 a.m., I want it to turn these three lights mm-hmm. on at, you know, and set them to orange so that my driveway has some light, but it's not super bright. It's this orange kind of softer light. And I, and then 10 minutes later, I want it to turn it off. And and I actually can do that. I was doing it with Stringify. Now, Amazon uh, added a wait function to routines on the, the A-Lady app. So I could do it there. And HomeKit does have a wait and then turn these things off function. Uh, that's been a little bit wonky for me, but probably because I'm, you know, ring isn't, I'm, I'm linking ring through Homebridge. So maybe that's why that, mm-hmm. that hasn't been reliable, but yeah, yeah that's where it, things um, get cool. Yeah. Yeah. I registered, um, the ring okay. and, uh, and it, and it does, uh, have a motion entry. Yeah. So if I wanted to do something saying, okay, if you see motion, then you do, do this or that. Sure. Sure. Um, the other neat thing that this environment has that the the wink didn't is that um, my thermostats are battery powered. When I put them in the wink environment, it didn't it, it wasn't able to report or sense the battery level. It yep. does in smart things. Oh, nice. Okay, so yeah, and this is a funny thing, right? Like it, the API for in this case your thermostats. It has all kinds of things, but your previous hub only tied into, you know, the whoever wrote the the plugin 
only mm-hmm. chose to tie into a couple of those things. Whoever wrote the plugin for smart things decided to use a couple more. And that's where things get, get, you know, yeah. super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I figured, you know, this should be available. I mean, I can, uh, you know, I can punch the buttons on the thermostat and it'll tell me what the battery level is. So, you know, why can't the uh, API, I don't know, but, um, so I created another action saying, okay, if the, uh, um, if the battery level is below 10%, then let me know so I can. Yeah. Okay. And where did you put that action? Is that on your smart things or did you put that in Alexa? Yeah. Oh, the, sorry. A lady <laughs> trying not to trigger everybody's homes now. Yep. Yeah. I just created another, uh, uh, automation within the environment. Yeah. Okay. In smart things. Yes. Got it. Yeah. And also what they got here is cool is that they have a whole bunch of ones that, uh, uh, people have, uh, people have written um, okay that like coordinate your your uh, your devices for example if if you leave the house it'll lock the door it's like oh that's a good idea yeah right okay yeah or, so this uh, is where it gets another fun. one um if uh let me know if if uh, inclement weather is coming and the windows are open because you can get a i guess you know sensors to say whether your windows are open or closed oh smart light yeah i mean they got, they got a whole bunch where you can like I said, make your own. So, um, sorry, Wink. I mean, um, and someone, uh, one listener actually forwarded an article where, uh, um, I forgot who wrote it, but, um, it was basically saying we can't recommend Wink anymore for a number of reasons. My reason now is the outages. I, yeah. I, you know, I, that's a pretty, that's a pretty um, good reason. Uh, you know, the other thing, the other weird thing is that try to buy one. Try to buy a Wink Cub too. I I wasn't able. The only one I found is that somebody on Amazon is selling one for like two hundred. Sure, 200. sure. The retail price on it is ninety nine dollars. But right. um, there's no, a it concern. Sounds like Wink Wink might be going out of business here, right? I mean, if they're not selling hubs and they're not keeping their service reliable, so mm-hmm. I would I would think maybe that's that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was a good run. It's a uh, you know, capable product and supports, uh, you know, generic things. But, um, yeah, I mean, if their service isn't reliable, um, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Sorry guys. So Alex in the chat room asked a question. I think this is the question he's asking. Um, he says, is smart things something that works with home kit? And I believe the answer to that is, is definitively no, it is not a native HomeKit supported device. However, I am 99% certain that there is a HomeBridge plugin for smart things. So you could tie that into HomeKit if you want to use HomeKit to manage your house and, and all of that. Uh, you can tie that in. And, and you know, there's nothing wrong. Like, I don't think I'm going to standardize on, on HomeKit as my automation hub, but I will continue to run Homebridge because it's it's handy to at least have the option of using Siri or, you know, the home app, uh, not only on my phone, but other people's phones in the house to control these devices because you're not limited to just one thing being able to control it. To your point, John, right? You you have your your smart things hub, but you also have your Amazon a lady and and that can either via smart thing, smart things or not, depending on how it has to work that can also control things. Right. So, so it, it, you know, other than the headache of maintaining the, the the connection and the service, especially with Homebridge, where there's a little bit of headache there, there's no reason not to have multiple things out there um, going. So, and we'll talk about more of this stuff. In fact, I I do want to share one thing. Uh, Listener, Chris sent in, we were talking, he had an email going back and forth about uh, smart things, and WebCore, because you have the SmartThings app, which is mostly, you know, it's it's functional. And then, but it's limited because it's, you know, meant to be used by by anyone that buys this thing. And then there's WebCore, which really is, you know, you don't need to be a programmer to use it, but you kind of need to be able to think in terms of logic flow and things like that to, you know, make it work. And it, that would be uh, more than many people would want. So they keep WebCore separate, although all works with the same hub. There's an app out there called Smart Rules uh, at smartrulesapp.com that it seems like uses WebCore, 
but gives it a simpler phone based graphical interface. So if you have a smart things hub, John web uh, smart rules might be a good app to check out. And uh, I think it's available for free with in-app purchases. I'm not sure there's probably, you know, you can have a couple of scripts running and then if you need more, you, you pay or something like that. But he says he's, he's able to uh, set up all of his rules and scenes and he, he really likes that. So I just wanted to throw that out there too. So thank you, Chris fun. Yeah. I like this stuff We're you know, I feel like we're at a um, sort of the next plateau now of smart home where there's enough devices out there. They're economically priced such that it makes sense for many of us to have a few of these. And if you can find the right thing to tie it together, and that's sort of the quest we're on right now. Um, home kits, one option, but you need either HomeBridge or every device to be home kit compatible. Uh, so there's some limitations there. Uh, smart things is another option, but you know, a lady from and 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 google assistant are also options here and they can be your you know your automation hub and like i said the a lady hub is is pretty good for you know simple to moderate automation which might be all any of us need so we'll we'll continue down this path while we're walking any any thoughts on that path before we uh before we move on my friend no it's a uh... It is what it is. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right. Andrew writes uh, uh, while we're still on the, the smart home thing. Andrew says, uh, after seeing too many friends and family members have flooding of different degrees in their homes, I would like to ask if you have a smart water alarm system that you can recommend. It doesn't need to shut off the main water valve, but obviously that's a nice option to have. He says, I don't mind using a hub. Uh, and he says, I would like to be able to place eight to 10 of these sensors around my home. Sensors should be able to be powered by, you know, double A AA or triple A batteries or something like that. Have a loud audible alarm and be smart enabled so that they can trigger some sort of alert, even if it doesn't have the ability to shut off the water. He says the best option I've found so far, uh, but as of February 19, uh, is something that iPhones could not use in more than three of them. And he'll send a link to this. I will see if I can go there while we're going through all of this. But um, he says, I think it's a serious issue. This flooding thing that uh, is not taken seriously by enough people. So he found the Govy Wi-Fi water leak detector, but uh, it supports only three of these sensors. But it's relatively inexpensive. It's 55 bucks and it is it, it's Wi-Fi. So uh, so there you go. Uh, yeah. So, and he's right. You know, I don't have one of these in my house, but as I'm reading this, it's like, man, like when it comes to floods, I will tell you, it is not an if scenario. It is a when scenario. Uh, and of course you might not put a sensor in the spot where your flood happens. So there's also that, but there's some places where it's likely to happen. And those would be good places to have these sensors so that you're not caught by surprise. I, I came home from vacation once and uh, it, we had a flood of sorts. Our fish tank sprung a leak. So even if we had had sensors, I don't think I would put one, uh, you know, on the floor in front of the fish tank. But uh, so that was a, that was sort of a, you know, an interesting thing. Thankfully the fish all survived because it only leaked out about half the tank. It was at a, you know, part of the seam, but anyway, uh, you this will happen john had a flood right when when you had your your pipes burst so like it happens and mm -hmm. and it will happen so yeah so this is good i i kind of want to throw this out as a geek challenge we've we've run into a couple of these john you you ran into one uh it doesn't have sensors last year at ces but but monitors flow or something is that right they're able to who uh it's flow Flow, F L O, right? Yeah, I saw them a couple of years ago, but um, yeah, from what I can tell, they take a combination of. Let me see. They, they uh, let's see, pressure, flow rate, and temperature. So they they read those three values, and depending on what they are, they can determine if there's a leak, huh? Okay. Or other terrible things happening, and this is one that. It'll actually uh, turn off the water because a lot of times 
if you have a leak or something like that, you want to make sure it doesn't flood your basement. So yeah. if this detects something wrong, you can have the option to uh, to shut it off. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. This looks neat. like you, yeah. you install it in line. So there's some plumbing required, it looks like, to to set this one up. Yeah. You'd, you'd want to get a plumber to do Got this it. for you. Yep. Yep. Or if you're used to sweating pipe, then you probably do it yourself. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, I ran into one also last year at, at CES called Guardian. And this one, it, actually, it's, it's interesting. It, it, they do have sensors and the sensors, um, you know, you can put wherever you need to. Uh, they are battery powered. And then it also has a uh, part of the unit that that you doesn't require a plumber, at least from what I can tell you clamp it onto your pipes and it's got a, a motor that you put on top of your shutoff valve. So it grabs your shutoff valve for you and opens or closes it depending on uh, whether or not you're having a leak. So this, I, I, I have not tried this, but you know, now that, that we're talking about it and Andrew's brought this up, I feel like if I don't put something like this in place, I'm going to have a nice story to tell you about how I regretted not putting something like this in place. But um, but yeah, I, so there's stuff out there. I would love to hear, you know, from everybody. Um, if you've uh, if you've got one, send it in, you know, find us somewhere. You can find us on Twitter, too, at Mac Geekab. So send a send us a note there if uh, if if you don't want to use the email that we provided previously. Good on this one, John. So far. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's the problem <laughs> so far. Yeah. Uh, I want to take a second and talk about our second sponsor today, which is Malwarebytes for Mac. This is an app that uh, I run on all of my Macs. I'm pretty sure John runs it on his Macs. You know, for years, we Mac users got to be a little bit smug about how our Macs weren't targeted by people making malware and viruses and all of that. And then Macs got more popular. And now we are targets of these things. Um, Thankfully, not quite as widespread as our, you know, Windows using brethren, but it's out there. And I, you know, keep my Mac scanned at least once a week, if not all the time, because I I don't want to get caught. Right. Like that's what we talk about here all the time. Don't get caught. Well, this is one way to not get caught. Go to Malwarebytes.com slash Mac. You download Malwarebytes for Mac. Proven technology that crushes these things, right? It can scan the average Mac in under 30 seconds. And this is true. It scans mine, all of mine in quite less than that. And it will detect. And also, if you like, you probably would like, remove adware, unwanted programs, viruses, ransomware, and of course, malware with their anti-malware technology. And it can do all of this in real time, if you like, too, so that it can catch all these threats automatically. So you're protected without even having to think about it. And your Mac keeps running silky smooth. So it's cybersecurity that's smart enough for the Mac. Visit Malwarebytes.com slash Mac. You can download this for free. You can use it for free. And also for free, you get a 14-day trial of their premium real-time offering. So you can see how that works too. Visit malwarebytes.com slash Mac. And of course, our thanks to Malwarebytes for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, let's talk about networks. It's fun stuff, don't you think? JP has a question for us. And JP says, I've noticed that Eero's speed test app always clocks my ISP bandwidth at super high levels, which leads me to believe that I'm getting that speed from my ISP. Yet, when I run speed test on my desktop or using the web version, it always shows me way less than advertised. So which one do I believe and why do you think this is the case? And he asks a question, a clarifying question that that will open the right doors here. He says, also, when Eero runs a speed test, is it defaulting to the gateway that is connected to the modem rather than the closest beacon or gateway to my device? So, yeah, when Eero runs it, this, this is a classic example of weakest link in the chain. So let's keep that concept in our heads while we sort of march through this. When Eero runs a speed test, it's running a speed test from the router Eero, so the one that is closest to your and plugged into your internet connection, either your cable modem or your you know DSL or whatever it is. But it is taking that one, the one that's running the show, and doing a speed test from that device out to the internet. 
So in theory, this is mean, not in theory, it, but with, for certain, this is going over a wired connection is not impacted by any of your devices or wireless or anything inside your house. It's just going from the Eero to the outside world. So it is truly testing your internet speed at its maximum. And I, I put an asterisk on that last little bit at its mask at, at its maximum, because it's possible. I've seen it where Eero speed tests have not been able to go high enough to say test gigabit connections. Most of the time they can, but not all the time. So if you have a gigabit connection and you're only seeing that hit, you know, five, six, seven hundred megabits per second, uh, that might not be an issue with your connection. There's you should do further testing before you are, are certain of that. But I have seen it get over nine hundred megabits per second uh, on on those. So, yes, that's what Eero is doing now when you run speed test from your Mac or from your iPhone or whatever that is testing. So that's testing your max speed out to the internet so when Eero runs a speed test it's testing the speed from the Eero when you run a speed test on your Mac even if you tell or on your iPhone even if you tell Eero to run a speed test inside the Eero app it is doing it from the router Eero out not from your device but when you run the speed test app or as he said you know you go to speedtest.net or any one of the various like DSL reports speed test whatever they are they are going from your device and so there might be a weaker link in the chain between you and the outside world. We know that in, in JP's case, his Eero is seeing whatever his maximum speed is. Let's call it gigabit for the sake of this, right? So he's getting you know, 950 megabits per second or something out there. And when he tests from his Mac, he's getting 200 megabits per second. Well, we know that the Eero can talk 900. So there's got to be a weaker link in the chain between the Mac and the Eero. Most likely that is Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi does not go at gigabit speeds uh, for any of our client devices. Uh, certainly we can get Wi-Fi to go gigabit speeds, maybe, but none of our client devices are capable of that. So uh, this is where, and, and Eero's devices are all two by two radios in them. So the maximum speed that you could get on a five gigahertz connection to a, with a two by two radios is 833 megabits per second because 802.11 AC is 433 per stream times two. Here we are 866, but you're never going to get that. You're more likely going to get about half of that. Maybe a little more. I've seen it hit 500, but nothing higher than that. And that's, you know, perfect conditions, no interference near the router, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, so that's what you're, you're getting. Uh, and that's why you're getting that. And it is that just weak link in the chain. And it's kind of nice to know that your internet connection is faster than your Wi-Fi can go. There may be a question as to why you want internet that can go faster than your Wi-Fi. Uh, but, you know, and, and if you've got devices plugged in Ethernet or, you know, multiple devices that if depending on how you have your Wi-Fi, you might be able to get all of them streaming at the same time. Like th there's there's some benefits there, but but it is a question worth asking. So. All right, John, thoughts on this now? <clears throat> weakest link in the chain yep yep <laughs> yep i think that's the right way to think about it right like in, in to kind of frame this thing i don't, I don't know of a yeah, better way um, yeah yeah it's just uh different tubes different size tubes think yeah that way right yeah yeah that's right yeah different size tubes yeah i like that yeah yeah it's not a it's not that it, it's a weak link it's a it's just a different size tube yeah 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 I, and hopefully that hopefully that helps. Um, but it does lead us to realize that Wi-Fi is great. And especially with 802.11 AC, like Wi-Fi can go fast enough for what we most of us need most of the time, if not all of the time. But it's not the currently not the fastest thing that we can have with Wi-Fi six. Uh, we might start getting there, but. Like I, I reserve the right to change my mind on that as we actually get to test it and see what it's like in the real world and all that good stuff. Uh, but if you can wire your house and you have Macs that you can plug in or devices that you can plug in and use those wires, you get two benefits. Number one, you get the benefits of Ethernet speed, which either go gigabit speeds or 10 gigabit if you want to go that route. So it's definitely going to be faster than Wi-Fi. 
What's also going to happen is you are decongesting your Wi-Fi. It's like Sudafed for your Wi-Fi, right? Because you're just taking out these extra devices so that the devices that have to use Wi-Fi aren't competing with devices that don't have to use Wi-Fi. So, uh, Karsten asks, uh, I'm building a new house and I want to run cat 6a 10 gigabit speed wiring throughout the house. I was wondering if anyone has any cool, cool tips on where to run cables, which might come in handy someday. As an example, I plan on wiring our closets with data and power for printer and network scanner placement power to maybe power a mesh point. If I want with ethernet backhaul. And, uh, he said, you know, so I, it's like he's going to wire extra places, which is totally smart. Like definitely when the walls are not yet up, wiring is super cheap. It gets way more expensive and way more troublesome once you have sheetrock screwed into place. Uh, he says, should I wire behind the fridge with data and cable TV? I'm thinking a smart fridge or a TV in the fridge. He says the wire is not expensive, so why not? Says I already plan on wiring for an HD antenna under the roof line connected to a four tuner home run recording to a Mac mini and move shows to my Synology he says I prefer to wire connect as much as I can so I can free up Wi-Fi just like we were talking about he says my Mac mini units and my Synology DS 1819 plus all have 10 gig Ethernet ports. So we'll have two separate ISP ISP feeds uh, with one gig each. That's great. That's a little overkill. For most of us, he says, but any advice is welcome. Just trying to avoid having to crack drywall open later. And it, like, that's exactly it. Um, my general advice is anywhere you think you might want Ethernet, put it. And at the very, very least, put at least one drop in every room. And yes, you might as well put it in the bathroom, too. I know it seems like you might like you would say, well, when am I ever going to put a device in the bathroom. I have two immediate examples that come to mind. Number one, you might want to put a Sonos speaker in there and you might want that wired or some other kind of smart speaker. Although home home uh, home pod doesn't have an ethernet port. That's fine. You also might want to use your bathroom as the place where you put a mesh point for your wireless network. And mesh points are always better if you can plug them in ethernet. So if you've got ethernet there, boom, you're good to go. Uh, so yeah, I, I would put at least one in every room and, and maybe, maybe more, you know, and, and if you've got like a walk-in closet, why not? Like, just like, and that's really the kind of the question to look at is why not, um, uh, make sure that you've got, you know, leave, leave yourself or the, you know, the next homeowner room for, uh, for creative expansion. What do you think about this, John? I think that my house has RJ 11 and, uh, Cable connectors in every room. <clears throat> well, right. But what do you think about Karsten? Oh, no, absolutely. I've always um, wired, I think, will always be faster. So as much wired stuff as you can place in as many places as you can yeah. put it. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. To your point, though, you know, like at your house and my house and and any of us that already have the drywall up without Ethernet behind it. Um, Mocha. The, the technology that sends effectively Ethernet signals over your existing coax wires in your walls can be the saving grace for you, uh, especially the, the bonded Mocha 2 adapters. I've, I've pushed almost 900 megabits per second over a crummy run of coax uh, with with those. And I and it, it is it is the reason that I have not had to crack open my walls or, you know, hire an electrician to figure out how to get an ethernet drop near my TV. It's uh, it makes a big difference. So it, that it is a stopgap measure and we'll, we'll put a link to the, uh, to the, the action tech bonded mocha two adapters in, uh, in the show notes. Those are basically the, the only ones to use these days. I think there might be some others, but um, I, I haven't found any that are super reliable yet. But uh, but we'll get there. We'll get there. So. All right. Uh, let's see. Where are we on time here? We had some comments from last week's show specifically about. Uh, well, we'll start with the private cloud stuff because, you know, Dropbox is changing. That's important. Right, John? Good. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one comes from Matt. Matt. So. 
He says, I was listening to your latest ep episode about Dropbox limiting the number of devices on free accounts. While this would not be a solution for everyone, I think a large number of your listeners, like me, have a Synology NAS. Okay, fair. He says, and I use CloudSync or CloudStation on my NAS. Oh, CloudSync on my NAS to sync a couple of different Google Drives and a couple of different Dropbox accounts to folders on the NAS. So it's true. You can, it's essentially running like the Dropbox client or the Google Drive client on your NAS so it can sync down all of this stuff. It's now got a copy of all the things that are on your Dropbox. He says, I sync these to folders that I then sync to all my Macs and iOS devices with Synology Drive. So the only thing that's syncing to Dropbox is his Synology unit. That's one. Okay, great. I, th I think that takes up one slot on your, you know, on your Dropbox thing when you have three, if your account is free. And then immediately all of those things are then synced using Synology Drive from his Synology to any number of his devices because that's his. So it's a great little workaround. He says it has several advantages. It works in both directions. So files shared with me from clients show up on my Mac. And if I delete a file from the folder inside Synology Drive, it disappears from Dropbox as well. He said this method also lets me sync multiple Dropboxes and multiple Google Drives uh, or multiple whatever else I want without having to install more memory stealing applications or, you know, jury rig things together. He says, if I need to share something directly from Dropbox or Google Drive, I just log into my account in my web browser, share the file and move on with life. This is brilliant. And really is a solution for anybody that's got a, a Synology. Any 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 flavor of Synology can do this. Uh, and it really could save you here. And also, even like without the uh, the Dropbox limitation, like being able to not run the Google Drive app and the Dropbox app and the Box app and all of that crap on your Mac, that like that, there's a benefit there too. I kind of like this. Um, that's not, it's not a bad solution. That's good thinking, Matt. I like this. What do you think about this, John? Yeah, I like, uh, I re recently, uh, upgraded to, uh, drive. Sure. And, uh, yeah, you and I talked about it a little bit and actually I read, I, I don't know why I didn't map the things properly the first time around, but now, um, it's backing up all the folders and Great. I do something similar. I I'll back up my, uh, Google drive and Dropbox to uh to the synology so are you doing that on the synology are you running cloud sync on your synology so that it does it natively or are you doing it like backwards well, running, from what matt well described? i'm running the drive app okay so right so you are it, th this is actually great because some other people and might it's be in one way sync and, and i'm in one way sync mode Okay, so here's the interesting thing. You are syncing you so you're running the Dropbox app on your Mac, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're running the Synology Drive app on your Mac and you are mm -hmm. having the Synology Drive app sync the contents of your Dropbox from your Mac to your Synology. Is that right? Correct. So here's a thing. And also can, my G, uh, Google and, Drive. And your Google Drive. So you can stop that because there's an app called Cloud Sync on mm -hmm. Synology that will connect your Synology directly to your Google Drive and your Dropbox and let them sync directly with your Synology. And then you can do what Matt yeah. does, turn off your Dropbox and Google Drive on your Mac and sync only with Drive, right? So the same exact thing, just, mm. ah, yeah, I know. Like when I read Matt's thing, it was like, dude. I like that because actually, yeah. yeah right. Well, yeah, the less... Pieces of software you're running, the less of a chance that something terrible is going to happen. Right. Or just consuming just consuming system resources. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put a link to CloudSync, but it's just a normal Synology app. Um, yeah. And and it'll sync Dropbox, Google Drive. Um, I think it, it does it, several others, too. Um, OneDrive. Like, yeah, it, it's this is great. I, I think it's good stuff. I Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to definitely change my life around with this um listener dan suggested doing something similar uh without a synology so this is for those of you that don't have a synology but want to, to like liked the discussion we just had and want to take advantage of it 
Dan suggests using Resilio Sync. So Resilio Sync used to be BitTorrent Sync. It is a peer-to-peer uh, syncing technology does not require a server. So you don't need that Synology though. There's, there's a client for Synology for Resilio sync as well. So you could do the same thing. Uh, have your Dropbox and Google drive sync to one Mac that hopefully is on all the time. And then sync that folder using Resilio sync to all of your other devices. So same exact concept, just using Resilio sync, uh, instead of, of, you know, Synology's uh, cloud sync and all that stuff. So yeah, it's a good tip. I like it. And the other thing that really excites me about all of this, John, is that up until a couple of days ago, Synology drive was not native for the iOS files app. You could, it, it would, you could make the files app, see it, but when you did, it would jump to like a different interface and it was kludgy and not, like not what you would want. Uh, it didn't feel native because it wasn't native and therefore you couldn't have like folders from within your drive as favorites in your iOS files app. Well, Synology drive 2.0 for iOS now native files support, and it's truly awesome. So you can take those folders and make them favorites. You can jump right to them. It is just like, having iCloud drive, you know, it's, it, 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 it lives at the same level as iCloud drive. Dropbox is also native uh, on iOS inside files. So now you really can just do this Synology syncing totally smoothly. Uh, and it's great. Uh, it, like makes a huge difference, especially timing, you know, where we are here uh, with, with what Dropbox is changing. So I'm really stoked. This is one of the things we love about Synology is, is yeah, they make these geeky sort of, you know, platform ubiquitous tools, but they're really focused on iOS and Mac apps and making them work well and, and expanding our functionality and sort of picking up where Apple leaves off. So it's just, it's good stuff. That's really good stuff. Uh, have you tried the new Synology drive app yet, John? No, I yeah, know. I just happened to see it last night. That it was like, wait a minute, this is, what's this native file support? I've wanted this for years, you know, and it was like, oh, yay, finally. So it's good. Uh, you know what else is good, John, is all of our Mac Geek Gab premium supporters. I want to take a minute, as we do, and thank everybody whose contributions came in in the last, I think, week and a half or well, two weeks, actually, uh, Wayne from Sacramento uh, had a $100 one-time contribution. So thank you very much, Wayne. You rock. Uh, on the monthly $10 plan, we had contributions come in from Jeff from Connecticut, Barry from Flying Overhead, Bob from Working Smarter for Mac Users, Ryan from Plano, Neil from Connecticut, Scott from Portland, Chris from Hertfordshire, or Hertfordshire. I don't know how if I'm saying that right. James from San Antonio, Joe from Kansas, Abdullah from Maryland, Ari from Oakland, Dave from Saugerties, Michael from Kansas, Bob from Quebec, Frank from Tunbridge, Tim from Tennessee, John from Pennsylvania, Santiago from Florida, John from North Carolina, Clyde from Virginia, Tony from Massachusetts, and Ken from Honolulu. So thanks to all of you. And then on the biannual $25 every six month plan, thanks to Kurt from Illinois. Louie from California, Bob from Massachusetts, James from California, Robin from Hampshire, Rob from New South Wales, Colby from Colorado, Barb from South Carolina at $30 every six months, Mark from California, Donald from Massachusetts, George from Massachusetts, Andy from New Hampshire, Ed from California at $50 every six months, Willie from Mississippi, Jed from New Jersey, Scott from Georgia, Steve from New Mexico, Laura from Washington, Scott from Arkansas, and Andrew from California. Our sincere thanks, as always, to all of you that uh, can and do contribute. Uh, it is not mandatory, as you know. Uh, we still take questions from everybody, but, you know, those of you that are premium members, you send a premium at MacGeekCab.com. Not only do you get that warm, fuzzy feeling of supporting your two favorite geeks, but you also get your questions answered first, because... That's, you know, it's just, it's what we can do. All right, John, let's, uh, should we jump to this time machine thing? Cause we seem to be having, uh, some time machine issues again lately. Shall we? Uh, yes. Uh, let's see. So Mark, uh, 
Mark says, I have a 2009 MacBook Pro and a 2015 MacBook Air, both backing up wirelessly to a USB hard, hard drive that is plugged into my uh, Apple time capsule router. Other family members are backing up to the internal drive on the time capsule with no problems. And my MacBook Pro is backing up to the external drive with no problems as well. The problem this morning is coming from the air. About once a week or so for the past month, I get the message that Time Machine completed a verification of your backups. And to improve reliability, Time Machine must create a new backup for you. The first two times I let it start one and it worked properly for a few days before the error came back. And the most recent time I encountered the problem, I disabled Time Machine, deleted the sparse bundle and started completely from scratch. And this seemed to do the trick for 10 days before giving me the dreaded error. It's frustrating. Why is this happening? So, yeah, this is a common issue with Time Machine. Um, in fact, I was just talking about it recently at the uh, PMUG meeting down that I did in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, in general, Time Machine is built for direct attached disks, like some disks that you are plugging directly into your Mac uh, and has proven over the years to be wholly unreliable for many scenarios of network backups. Yes, I know. Apple made the time capsule for exactly this, but they didn't really make it for exactly this. They just created it and sort of, you know, shoved this functionality into time capsule or time machine to allow it to back up over the network. But it's, it's flaky. Um, and I, and I use it that way. Like I, I think John, you do too, but time machine is a client only protocol. And what that means is it is 100% up to your Mac to manage the state of the backup the server, in this case, the time capsule, but you could back up to a Synology and Western Digital has some cloud devices that'll you know let you back up time machine, et cetera, et cetera. The server is dumb in these scenarios. There's nothing it can do to facilitate the backup other than just sharing the folder and letting your Mac put whatever it wants into this folder. And so what it's going to put in there is a sparse bundle and your Mac has to keep that sparse bundle in shape. It would be much better if your Mac was handing files to some server app on your time capsule, and that was then writing those files down so that it could manage that sparse bundle and keep it from getting corrupted by say network interruptions, because when you're writing to a sparse bundle and you lose access to it because uh, you know, the network dropped sometimes perhaps too often it gets corrupted. And that's what you're seeing here. Uh, it It's likely that the way you're using your air, it is, you know, at um, maybe it's it's got weaker Wi-Fi signal or something or somebody shutting it off in the middle of backups or whatever it is. Uh, it's just not built for this. So you can you can manually you can turn time machine off, which really just turns the scheduler off and only back up manually when you know that you are in a scenario where that is going to be most reliable. Uh, but otherwise, like there's, there's no magic answer here is unfortunately what i got john what do you got i got a magic answer yeah man so i remember when i first off i'm i'm with you um in the analysis of this is that there was something weird happening over the network now i don't know if it was a bug in time machines implementation or or what i just think it's that you i mean if you if you write to a network drive and then you know yank your connection like it's it's going to get corrupted, especially when you're creating a disk image inside, like a, a convoluted disk image inside of a, ne like, it's just, it's, it's bad. <laughs> I th I think that's all it is. The thing is I had, I had the problem much less often once I moved to the Eero. So I think it was the quality sure. of the, uh, time machine Wi-Fi. Um, though I, it, that makes sense. So, yeah, you know, once I, you got I, a, a reliable I, wireless network, things got better, which makes, which, which fits. Yeah. I'll buy that. Yeah, the um, the thing, the disconnection thing, I do that regularly. And that if I'm running a time machine backup from my uh, MacBook Pro, sometimes I'll put it to sleep, and when I wake it up again, it it you know resumes. Uh, it knows that it's supposed to continue backing up. And sure. I ha I have not experienced any corruption in uh, ages. But when I did, here's a suggestion: make a backup of your backup. Mm. And I may be like, that's crazy talk. Why would you do that? Well, I had situations where I would do a backup from my, uh, I would back up my time machine backup from one Synology to another one. And when I did have a corruption issue, 
um, what would sometimes fix it is, uh, why don't you go to back to the good one that you had yesterday? And that would fix the problem and it, it would catch up. So I like back that. Up your ba- back yeah. up your backup. So maybe you, you want to take your, uh, your time machine back up and maybe a uh, carbon copy cloner it. Yeah, or, right. well, yeah, that's right. I mean, if it's on your Synology or something, like, you can have it do the backup of the backup, and that's mm-hmm. way that's way more efficient, because then you're not, like, doing it across the network again. But if... Yeah, it, I, with, I yeah. hyper... Yeah, I hyper backup... Yeah. Everything from one to the other. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. Um, Phil has a related time machine question. It says, I came across something I've never seen before. Uh, in each case, I was starting a backup... After there had been a substantial gap in time since the last one, uh, it says, I was surprised to see that the amount Time Machine wanted to back up was actually larger or almost as large as the source hard drive, but definitely more than the data on the drive. How can that be? Perhaps there were local snapshots that needed to be transferred from the local drive to the attached hard drive. Yeah, I, I think that's that's probably part of it. It's also possible, you know, I, I mentioned in the last show that I was having a problem where time machine was telling me it needed to back up more than the space I had given it, which also interestingly enough was more than the space that it was coming from. And I dug around and found that that Acronis true image had set up a cache file that was essentially a, a sparse bundle that could grow to be 500 gigs, but was not 500 gigs. But for whatever reason, Time Machine saw it as a 500 gig thing or a 432 gig thing or whatever it was and and was like, well, I got to make room for this 432 over here. I can't do it. Um, I wasn't currently using True Image on that machine, so I, I removed it. But if I were using True Image, then I would have just excluded that folder from Time Machine. I used Clean My Max uh, Space Lens to find that file. It was the only one that found it. Daisy Disk didn't even see it. So, um, so I, that's what I would do is, is actually run something like clean my Mac space lens and, um, and see if, you know, if you've got some file that's just massive and huge, uh, this is, that might, that might, that might do it. Thoughts on that, John, before we leave time machine behind yeah. for the day. Yeah, I had, I don't know what caused it, but, um, I had a weird thing the other day where you know, it's starting to do the time machine backup. Then it's like, um, yeah, I'm going to back up this much data on the disk that has less than this amount of space. And I'm like, um, aren't you supposed to like check, check yeah. that before you start the backup that there's enough space? Yeah. yeah. And I let it run. And also it was huge. Um, I think it was after an OS update, but um, now that could do it too. Cause a lot of files get touched in that scenario. Mm-hmm, yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, sense. And what happened is it it ran until it ran out of space, and then it said, "Hey, I ran out of space. Um, I'll I'll try to free some up uh, the next time around." And it did. Oh, that's good. Yeah, sometimes I mean, I've like, seen that where it takes like it'll say, "I ran out of space," but I'll I'll try next time, and it takes a couple of times, and then sort of sorts itself out. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, one question that seems to come up a lot, uh, unrelated to time machine. We'll leave that behind for now. Uh. Aaron asks, why is there no T2 chip in the 2019 IMAX? He says, at this point, the T2 chip should not be too expensive. I'm wondering if the redesigned IMAX body was not ready, so Apple just slapped an i9 in the current slash classic body. Thoughts? Um, I think the reason, because the, the the same could be said for the Mac Mini, right? The Mac Mini was essentially shoved into the same body, give or take, right? And And it has a T2 chip, but there's one difference between the two. And that is the Mac mini is not sold with any sort of rotating hard drive. And the iMac is, you can still get a fusion drive on the low end one. And for a lot of people that's, you know, in terms of balancing cost for features, that's probably not a bad way to go. And I really think that the T2 requires the SSD to be effective with the way that, you know, file vault and all that works on it. Um, I, I think that's the, the, the reason for it. And, and I'm actually, you know, really stoked about the new iMac refresh because no longer is there too much overlap between what the Mac mini can do and what the iMac can do. Like all the new iMac machines are essentially pro machines. You can still get that sort of low end, older, non-refreshed in 2019 iMac, right? 
But the ones that were refreshed, those are all like, those are pro machines. And, I, you know, the top end Mac mini is arguably a pro machine as well. But to me, that's really the only overlap that exists. And, and that's a good thing. It's nice to kind of have a clear line, clear-ish line, much clearer than before line. So, yeah. What do you think, man? Huh. I don't have a T2 chip. Right, right. It's a yeah. good movie, though. <laughs> right? I mean, uh, the effects were awesome. Sure. For their time? Yeah. All right. I'll give you that. Yeah. <laughs> liquid metal. That, that was. Li- yeah, liquid metal was cool. Yeah, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Uh, you know what? While we're on this T2 thing and file vault and all that, we'll, we'll head down this path with Karsten. This might cause us to run a little long, but, uh, but it, it does answer this. He says, um, a friend of mine called and said his older MacBook pro that is five years old died, uh, with, uh, with p- to power indications. He says, Oh, I tried a different, uh, power supply and no joy. In the good old days, we simply ejected the hard drive and placed it in an external enclosure and extracted the data. In this case, file vault is enabled. So what does one do to extract the data? It says, I believe my assistance is at its end due to file vault and told my friend to get an Apple appointment to ask for their flat rate uh, f- repair. He says, with any luck, it's, it is a bad power supply and all his data is safe. It says the reading, reason for emailing is to see what options we have to recover the data off a dead laptop today. With file vault, I believe you are just out of luck and only Apple can assist. What if a laptop powers on? And has file vault enabled. Can we power the laptop in target disk mode to get the data off? And how do we battle the T2 chip for OS issues? We hope we can reinstall via recovery and that will do the trick. He says, I suppose that one could eject the drive and create a second user account on an existing Mac and log in with that and hope the file vault key is stored there. But what if the SSD is built right into the motherboard? It goes without saying that backups are now more important than ever, especially when encryption is in play. He says, I just, uh, I, I hope, uh, the geek community, uh, I'm not sure what he's saying here, but anyway, he's right that, that backups, when you encrypt your data, you, you know, that one more vector for you to lose access to your data. It doesn't require a failed drive necessarily. Uh, if the computer around the drive fails, that also can be an issue, especially with a T2 equipped Mac. So he's right that. With file vault, and, and now we're not talking T2 specifically yet, but we'll get there. With file vault, a recovery key is set when you enable it. And it's a really good idea to securely store that key somewhere if you need it. If you haven't, iCloud might be able to help. Um, and we'll put a, a link to an article about how your key might be sta- stored in iCloud if you answered that question when you were going through. Um it's it, but it's an interesting scenario now with T2 and, and just to be fair, if you don't store your key somewhere uh, and iCloud could be one somewhere, if it's not stored somewhere else, you may not be able to, to access that drive like that data is there's no like Apple doesn't have a master key for you for this. So it iCloud is is your hope. And most of the time it is stored there. So it, it can you can be in, in OK shape. It gets more interesting with T2. Now, the T2 chip is the security chip that's in uh, the new Apple laptops. And as we mentioned, the new Mac mini, but not the new iMacs. And it takes care of a lot of this security stuff. For target disk mode, it does not get in the way. You can still use target disk mode with the T2 chip in its default mode. But you can't boot from an external drive with the T2 chip in its default mode. You need to go in to the system we talked about it in the last episode and I forget the name of it, but it's the, so maybe somebody in the chat room will help me, but there's the, you go into recovery mode on the Mac before you have a problem and you can turn off some of these features with the system recovery agent or something where you're essentially, or the system security agent uh, where you are, you know, managing what the T2 chip limits. And one of those things is whether or not you want to be able to boot from an external, Um, but you can boot target disk mode. The problem is, though, if you extract the drive from that Mac, let's say that you're in this scenario and the Mac's power supply dies and you extract the drive, the key is not on the drive. The key is on that T2 chip. So if the Mac that it came from cannot be powered with the drive in it, you might not be able to get at that data at all. So, yeah, that's uh, 
that's where things get interesting. And it is the uh, startup security utility. Thanks to Brian Monroe in the chat room. And I'll put a link to that in there, but that's where you can set what you want the T2 chip to, to do at some level. There's two things, secure boot and external boot that that's it. But yeah, there you go. What do you think, John? <clears throat> Sounds a bit too secure for my taste. Um, I, yeah, yeah. I, you know what? That's, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I've turned all this stuff off on mine. I, I, I want to be able to boot any OS and I want to be able to boot it from an external drive. And I realize this, you know, it's, it's eyes, wide, eyes wide open. I know that security wise, that's less, but Hey, there you go. And as Alan five sixty seven in the chat room says, always run a backup. Don't get caught. He's not wrong. He's not wrong, folks. Backups are just one way that we can, you know, get ourselves to the not getting caught realm. Right, John? Indeed. Listening to Mac Geekab is another way. Tell your friends to listen. Seriously. Like, that really, that helps us. You know, those iTunes reviews help us, but telling your friends helps us, too. It's, uh, it makes a big difference. We, we appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate you listening. We appreciate all your questions. We appreciate Cashfly at cashfly.com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. We appreciate our sponsors. Uh, as we mentioned in the show, Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com and malwarebytes.com slash Mac. But also, we appreciate all the other sponsors that we have. Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Barebone Software at barebones.com. Ops Genie at OpsGenie.com. Eero at Eero.com slash MGG. There's some more coming too. It's good. What do you think, John? What are you what are you thankful for on this uh, this wonderful Sunday before the Monday that this show's released? Any any three things maybe that you're thankful for? Or 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 more? I don't know. Three things? Yes. And they are. Don't get caught. Made up.